Hey, good morning. Yeah, I'm a few minutes late. I apologize for that. Um, somebody said I make too many apologies, so I won't apologize. I'll just tell you why. Uh, good morning. <laughs> so I had a link on uh, the program this morning that apparently Facebook uh, didn't like that felt you needed to be protected from. <clears throat> so they wouldn't even let me do the broadcast as long as it was in the comment box. So that's just amazing to me. <clears throat> now, I don't know the source. Um, hi, Cheryl. Hi, Isaiah. I don't know the the um, reputation that the source has. And uh, yeah, that's right. Um, I think it was called Brightness is the name of the uh, the news outlet. I you know I I listen to a lot of news outlets and I discern information, not the outlet. I you know I think that sometimes uh, good morning, sometimes uh, an outlet might air something that isn't correct. Good morning, Henry. Um, sometimes they might uh, say something that is considered conspiracy or whatever. It's uh, amazing. Somebody said the other day. Uh, what happens when all your conspiracies become fact and everybody admits they're fact and then people still want to believe they're not fact? It's just craziness to me. But anyway, <clears throat> so if you are interested in the what I consider to be a very important link and it's about being a patient advocate. Now, again, um, I understand that some news agency might become so you know, weirded out that they don't want to. Yeah, but I think most of it's about silencing um you know, people that go against the narrative. So anyway, uh, it's about being a patient advocate. It's simply a doctor who has his opinions, right? Okay, you don't have to agree with them. And a nurse who has her opinions, but they're talking about how to be a patient advocate. And so there are so many people right now that are going into the hospital more than I've seen in the past. And uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a scary thing, you know, because uh, hospitals have a certain protocol now that, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all uh, protocol when it comes to um, COVID. And, um, and so it's not the only thing people are going to hospital for, but it is certainly on the rise. I know a number of people myself. And I know a number of people that have uh, passed. Hey, Kevin. God bless you, my traveling friend. Blessings on all of you. So anyway, um, I want to talk about what the Bible says about the enemy of death. And I know this is perhaps not the most pleasant subject. Uh, I want to deal with it in a very delicate way today and um, uh, keep my, you know, hopefully keep my opinions out of it, or at least tell you when it's just my opinion. You know, Paul did that, not that I'm Paul, but he said, uh, you know, here's a thus saith the Lord, here's what the Lord says, and here's what I, I believe I, it's my opinion. He didn't use the word opinion, but he says, I believe I have the will of the Lord. And of course, if I don't, think my opinion is the will of the Lord, then why am I believing it? Okay, hey, Mike, God bless you. <clears throat> so, um, so again, the link, there is no link at the bottom of the page. There is a title to the link that I was going to put on there, but Facebook took it off. So if you want that, you will have to message me privately. And I'm not even sure if um, Messenger will let it on. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. There's a lot of information that's being squashed, and I tell you guys all the time, and I hope you're listening, because sometimes I talk to people, and it's just like, it's just, you can see their eyes glaze over, and they're just looking for a reason to, to dismiss what you're saying, but I'm telling you, we are in an information warfare right now. There are the powers of be, and they are powers of light and darkness. It doesn't mean everybody on this side is light or dark, or everyone on this side is light or dark. Please understand, we're not talking about people's motives, we're talking about actions, Okay, people that think they're doing good things and aren't. We're in a warfare of what you get to know to be the truth. I, uh, hi, Carmen. God bless you. Good to see you. It's been a good weekend. I hope it's been a good weekend for you all. It's a very hard weekend for me, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But um, there are people that feel like you're better off not knowing uh, what's going on. And uh, whole governments are doing this. Whole governments. Hey, Travis. I hope you're doing well. Amen. Newlywed, kind of, sort of. Whole governments are, are basically saying, you know what, it's better off if you don't know. Uh, because people respond dumb with, in dumb ways. And they do. We, we are human beings. We're not always smart. We don't always do the right thing. Hi, Debbie. 
Hey, thanks all of you guys for came, coming out to our uh, get together, our little soiree the other day. It was so much fun. Such presence of the Lord. I'm just so glad. Amen. Um, but, and, and again, I'm not trying to go too deep in, in the you know whole information part, but it is important that you understand. I hope by now, uh, if you haven't heard what I, you know, anything else I've said ever, you need to, you need to move beyond your regular, you know, last 20, 30 years informational source. If you're just still sitting down in the six o'clock news and watching the alphabet news, you know, you'll figure out what that is, who have admittedly, okay, I'm not, I'm, this is not a conspiracy. They have admitted that they have a very tilted way of viewing things and agenda. You know, got the governments of the earth for so long have decided. It started years ago when we decided it was okay to deceive people about what truly was happening. And you've seen the movies, you know, hurricane, or not a hurricane, but like an asteroid's coming or some virus, whatever, and they don't want to tell people because they don't want them to panic. This is a spirit that has gotten a hold of the governments of the earth. And uh, they feel like it's okay to keep information from the public so they don't panic. And I, I'm just saying, I'm a lover of truth. I believe it's right to know the truth. I talked to a group of uh, people in a church yesterday, and I just basically said, you know, just tell me the truth. I just want to know the truth, you know, and uh, I can deal with it then. If I'm about to die, I want to know it, and so I can deal with it. <laughs> if, I, if, you know, if uh, good things are going to happen, I want to know that truth. I just want to know truth. So anyway, so all that today. The link, I believe, is a super important one about how to be a patient advocate. If you want to know more about that, let me know. So today is day 336, words of encouragement. I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about the subject, the enemy of death. Now, I said I had a hard weekend and not nearly as hard as others. So I don't want to make this about me. <clears throat> but um, I lost some people this weekend. And uh, they've already posted these things on the Internet. So it's, it's not a secret. <clears throat> I don't believe I'm saying anything that... Um, that shouldn't be said. But I actually want to say their names. You know, there's a phrase that's kind of going around right now. And again, all of these phrases, you know, depending on in whose mouths they are and what their motive is, you know, I get it. But sometimes they really are good. And one of them is say their names. Okay. And I do believe that sometimes it's easy for people who perish, like the 13 soldiers who perished in uh, the bombing that happened in Afghanistan. I think it's good to say their names. When when a loved one, you know, there's some um, historical context in some cultures. Uh, I remember watching a movie once where the uh, the Aborigine culture was like, you, you're not ever supposed to mention the name of those who pass away because then you forget them. And that's just, I think actually, biblically, the opposite is true. Hey, Roy, I think we are supposed to say their names. I think we're supposed to honor the life that they had on the earth. And so, uh, this weekend, I lost some uh, family and friends. So my sister-in-law, uh, Dixie Vander Ark, and uh, who was Dixie Wood, originally my, it was my wife's sister. I don't even like sister-in-law and brother-in-law. I don't even like that, I, not to be, you know, weird or anything or too dogmatic. But when someone, when I marry into a family or, or something or someone is adopted into a family. I don't call them my adopted son or whatever. They're just, they're just son and daughter and brother and sister. So, um, my brother, uh, by marriage, Randy and my brother, Robert and my, um, his wife, Dixie and my sister, Teresa Wood and mom Wood. Yeah. Hi, Kathleen. They, um, they're my family on my wife's side on Linda's side. And we just lost, uh, our sister. Dixie over the weekend, and it's uh, very difficult. Uh, Robbie, I forgot to mention his name if you're watching, Rob. So first of all, I just want to say uh, we're praying for the whole family, and uh, we love you all, and asking God to give you strength and uphold you. The scripture that keeps coming to me are, um, amen, or um, uh, underneath are the everlasting arms. I forget where it's at, but the Lord, I get a picture over and over of Jesus standing behind someone with his arms underneath their arms, and they're almost like collapsed. Sometimes we do. We just collapse in the arms of the Lord. And I don't know how people make it through this without God. I, I just don't. And, and what's important is not that we just try to bring God in at the end, but that we live for him every day. But that's another subject. 
Anyway, so I just want to say that uh, Dixie, I want to say her name, Dixie Vanderark, was a wonderful, bright, beautiful person. She was kind of the glue that held her family together, and she was a loving, dear mom and wife of many years. So, And then um, the very next day, the very next day, um, while I was sitting in the pew in church, I'm getting ready to preach the gospel, and I'm sitting in the pew in church, and I get a text literally I'm going to say his name to uh, my good friend, Bob Marks, <laughs> uh, husband to Janine and father uh, to a number. I, I sometimes I forget names, but uh, Ben and uh, Bethany and uh, her husband, Brandon and grandkids, wife, Janine and Anyway, Bob was just a wonderful, wonderful man. I, and I don't even like saying was, because here's what I believe. Death is an enemy, but death is not the end. And uh, we tend to stir up those beliefs when someone passes away, and we need to. But again, it's good that we believe that all the time. Uh, death is one of those things that's inevitable, and yet the Bible still calls it an enemy. And I'm going to read that scripture in just a minute. But I, I first wanted to start out by saying... And these are just a couple that uh, we have lost in the last. And again, they're lost to us. They're not to the Lord. I don't like to say they were a good person. I try to catch myself. You know, Bob was a good person. Dixie was a good person. They are good people. I know that it almost feels like fantasy sometimes when someone goes away. We call it passing away because they're passing over. They are passing over. I guarantee you, I would stake my life, and I have, I would stake my eternal soul on the fact that those people are alive right now. They're alive in another dimension. Good morning, Elijah. Hi, Justin. <clears throat> They're alive in another dimension. They're alive in a, a world that is greater than this world. And uh, it's actually part of this world. If you could have your eyes open, you would see that there is another world that surrounds you all the time. Many people have seen that. They've had their eyes open to see angels. The Bible talks about the invisible things that, that God made. He made both the visible and the invisible. Sometimes, you know, we live in the visible, right? So we're not always cognizant or even thinking about the fact that there's the invisible world that goes all around us. And um, I remember the story of a lady named Betty Maltz. And if you've never heard this story, it's a fantastic testimony. And I'll probably butcher it and I won't go a long time here. But Betty was a believer and um, she uh, had a ruptured appendix. And if, I don't know if you know what happens, but it, peritonitis, the, the literal uh, acid-like substance that's in the, the appendix, when it bursts, it goes, starts moving through the body. And if you don't catch it quick enough, it can literally, hey, Randy, hey, Elijah, it can literally uh, eat up the organs. And after a period of time, there's nothing that could be done. And so uh, she had an appendicitis attack, suffered through it for a few days, thinking it was just a bad stomach ache. And then actually what it goes away. This is how a uh, burst appendix works. And so when they finally did catch it, she went like 14 days, which is nearly impossible. Most, most ruptured appendix can't go that long. Anyway, they opened her up, finally got her to the hospital because of fever and all that. And they said her body is riddled with peritonitis. She will not live. And she didn't. She passed away. And like so many testimonies hey, you've heard, I, I love these testimonies with all my heart. Because, again, death is an enemy, but death is not the end, okay? It's the enemy, but it's not the end. Two E words. It's the enemy, but it's not the end. You need to keep telling yourself that. You need to understand that it's true. It's not a fantasy. It's not just some comfort mechanism that somebody came up with so that we could deal with the loss of a loved one. Death is an enemy, but it's not the end. So they opened Betty up, and uh, she died. And she literally said she saw herself on the hospital bed. And you've heard this many times. I've heard it many times. I've experienced it in just a little different way. That's not my story. But she, she sees herself on the hospital bed and they're all crying and they're weeping as they should. And, and, uh, and she's standing there like going, I'm right here. I'm right here. What would your loved one say to you right now if they had the permission of the Lord to speak to you? What would they say? And so Betty, actually, she, she says she, and I'll stop right here, but she says she looked out the window and she kind of started moving. She's, she's, her spirit is alive. Her, her body, her flesh suit, you know, is now dropped away, but she's alive. And she, as she goes out, she moves outside the window, just kind of goes right through it. And uh, 
she says she's looking in the parking lot of the hospital and she notices something she'd never seen before. I'm talking about there being this invisible world all around us. She says she sees a green hillside coming right up out of the middle of the parking lot. Now, those two things were coexisting, but she never could see them before. What I'm trying to tell you is there is an invisible world. And when a loved one passes, they become a part of that world that is both aware of this world and that world at the same time. So Betty was aware of the, the hospital room. She was aware of this world. She could see the doctors. She could see her loved ones. But now she could see something she hasn't seen before. If you ever read testimonies of people that have gone on into an, the, the next life, they will always say very similar things. They, I mean, they're different experiences, but they're pretty, you know, pretty close to the same. And one of the things they said is that the world that they went into was greater or more real. This is the phrase they use. It was more real than this were, world. And I think what they're trying to describe is suddenly they had always seen this world, but suddenly that world was added to this in their ability to see. Do you get what I'm saying? It was always there. So it's not more real. That's probably an insufficient way of saying it. But, but if your eyes could be open right now and you could see the invisible world, who knows all that you'd see? You'd see angels, you'd see demons. Who knows? Maybe, I don't know if you'd see, I don't know how all that works. But what I'm saying is this, even though it feels like this is all there is sometimes, and we kind of live in this reality where we think this is all there is, it's certainly not all there is. And this is something that not only strengthens you in life, but it strengthens you in passing too, or the passing of your loved ones. So um, again, I just uh, I ask for prayer for myself, not, not primarily for myself, for my family, uh, for the spouses that have lost their loved one, their, their beloved uh, for their uh, brothers and sisters who are left to mourn their loss and hope for a day. You know, we, uh, we live for that day, right? That we're going to see them. And one day, it's the, death is the one unavoidable appointment. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this a judgment. It is one appointment no one cannot keep. And uh, we don't like to talk about it, you know, because usually during the time we're talking about it is a time of difficulty and so we just want comfort and we want consolation. And the Holy Spirit is right there to comfort and console you. So lean on him. Can I just say this? Do not lean on the bottle. Are you listening? Man, I feel the Lord on that. Do not lean on the bottle. Do not run to the pill for your comfort. Do not run to the weed. Do not run to having, you know, intimate relationships with someone you shouldn't. Don't lean on those things. Lean on the Lord. Jesus is here at this moment to give you strength, but he will not force it upon you. He says, I want to give it to you, but you got to ask. You have to, you have to come to me. And so lean on the Lord. Don't lean on the bottle. Don't run to the bottle for your comfort. Don't keep yourself inebriated in order to handle, because once you come out of that, you'll still have to deal with it that the Lord is wants to be quick. He has called the comforter. Okay. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter. So let's read the verse. And then I'm not, uh, I'm not going to go too long today because uh, obviously I've got family things to deal with, but, but I just want to read you again, always turn to what the Lord says, get his opinion. So I was up this morning. I was having a really hard morning. And I, I kind of just not wanted to do the program today. I'm just going to be honest. I kind of just wanted to let it just get on and say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not doing so hot. I just want to go. But I'll tell you what I did instead. Hi, Holly. I opened up his word. And I said, Lord, I'll, I'll do it. Show me what to do. And of course, this is on my mind. I'm pretty sure it was the Lord, but you know, you know how that goes. So I opened up. And as I'm reading these words, I feel a shift. Okay. I feel his peace come on me. I remember lying in the hospital bed the first time. I'm pretty sure I had a heart attack. They didn't think it was, but I'm pretty sure after I had the second one <laughs> that they did know. I think the first one was one too. But anyway, I'm lying there and I should feel anything but peace. Uh, you know, there are times that you can have the peace of God that passes, you know, reality. I mean, it just passes understanding. When it says understanding, it just means it doesn't make sense. It shouldn't, make, it shouldn't be happening right now. And I'm laying there on that hospital bed. Hey, Justin. And, um, and I am, I'm afraid I, you know, I think I could be dying and I believe this stuff. 
Okay, I preach it. I believe it with all my heart. And yet when it happens to you or someone next to you, we're not supposed to just be la la la, praise the Lord, let's sing a song. You know, I mean, it's a real thing and you really feel it. And okay, don't be, don't, don't go in. The Bible says, you know, when someone is grieving, it says, weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. And then there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, you know, someone who comes in cackling in laughter while others are weeping, it's like, I don't remember how it says it, but it, it, it's the idea it's like scraping your fingers on the chalkboard. Don't do that. Okay. Identify with their pain. Identify with their sorrow. Identify with their joy. So I'm laying there. Hi, Melanie. Laying there in the hospital bed, and I feel a peace that comes on me that was, um, uh, I can't even explain. It. And I'm, I'm literally kind of looking around the room and going, my God, why do I feel like this? I shouldn't feel this way right now. And I almost felt guilty about it. This is the peace the Lord wants to give you through the time. You, you will. If you are experiencing the loss of a loved one, and I have a sneaking suspicion that we're going to be experiencing this a lot. There's probably very few people that are watching that haven't lost a loved one in uh, the recent past. And, uh, you know, it's right to grieve. It's right to feel this. You're going to shed tears, and that's right. It's not just, okay, it's right. You should have a sense of that. But you also don't have to just decide that that's going to be your new normal. You can embrace the comfort of the comforter of the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, you know, I want to go through this. I want to grieve. I want to be in a right frame of mind for those who are around me. But I also want to feel your peace. And trust me, he will give it to you if you ask. All right, so let's read this, and then I'm going to close up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. As always, the Lord has something to say about every issue, okay? It may not deal with it directly, but or maybe indirectly it will, but this is one that it deals, it has much to say about the passing precious. Okay, I didn't put this on here, but you can look it up. I hope you look up scriptures. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Okay, and he takes no pleasure, it says in another verse, in the death of the wicked. He's not willing that any should perish. And, uh, well, I just feel like I got to tell you this story again. I know I've said this story many times, but if it's if it's ever applicable, it's applicable. My own father passed away a few years back. It's probably been more years than I realize now. My dad, Ed Moore, I'll say his name too, was a wonderful man. He was not always a good man, okay? Just like you and me, okay? We tend to do that at uh, when someone's passed. We talk about the good things, which we should. There's an old saying that says you shouldn't speak ill of the dead. When someone passes, it's not the time to bring up their their uh, stuff they did. Okay, Because there's something you need to remember. When someone passes, there's going to be this temptation to be angry at God, to be angry at people. Um, don't give place to anger. It won't help you. It won't bring the loved one back. It won't make you feel better. Okay, don't give place to that. Break your agreement with that anger. Know that the Lord is the Lord of living and, and dying. He is the Lord of everything. And okay, so anyway, my dad was uh, not a believer. He did not believe in the Lord. I mean, and when I say believer, I know he believed in his heart. He was actually raised in a, a pretty spiritual Pentecostal home, but he rebelled against that. And uh, in his mind, I think it might have had something to do with the death of his brother. I'm being real intimate here, telling you my stories. Um, but his brother died, I believe, in the military. And, uh, you know, that can do something to a person's heart. I've seen this happen so many times, and it's tragic. It is though we blame God and we say, you shouldn't have done this. Why did you do this? We all know it has to happen sooner or later. And yet when it does happen, we get angry with God. And and I believe this happened to my father, my, uh, Ed Moore. And... Um, uh, he lived his life like that. If God is real, then why does he let this happen? And this is a larger question. You know, why does God let, you know, six million Jews die? Why does God let children suffer? Why does God allow war? And all these things that we're always putting on God when really it's about humanity. Anyway, I'm not going to go deep in that, but that's how he was. So he came right up into his deathbed, not accepting Christ as his Lord. And Jesus said out of his own mouth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to heaven but by me. But I am amazed 
at the length that God will go to to win a human soul over to himself, to help people understand that everything he does is done from love. And yes, that even means allowing the consequence of sin and sickness that's in the world. You know, the Lord, if, if he just came and obliterated all that, basically, if you think of this through, it would mean our will would be gone. I don't have time to go into that. But so I'm amazed at what he did for my dad. So my dad is, uh, he went into the hospital with complications of, uh, I think he wound up having pneumonia because of some other stuff. I won't go into it. Anyway, he, they put him in a coma, a medically induced coma. I don't know if any of you have ever had that happen. And it all happened very quickly. It happened in a matter of just a few days, and it was unexpected. And lots of times it is unexpected. And sometimes the Lord actually gives us time to prepare our hearts for that, this inevitable thing. And other times it happens suddenly, and it's always harder, I think, when it happens suddenly. So the nurses told us when we went in the hospital, they said, your father is under a medically induced coma. They were doing that in order to keep his body uh, from, you know, giving it the amount of strength it needed to fight off these things that were going on in him. So in other words, zero energy being expended, uh, body focused entirely on getting better. And they said this, he's, he's in a coma. He cannot respond. He couldn't blink his eyes. He couldn't squeeze your hand. He couldn't do anything. They said, but he is fully aware of what you say when you come into the room. Okay. So they were telling us, you be careful what you say when you go to see your dad, because don't, don't sit in the room and talk about him as though he's not there and plan his, his departure and his memorial service. And all. Don't do that because he's there. He's awake. He knows what's going on. He just can't respond. And so, of course, we went in and we spoke life to him. We told him we loved him. We prayed for him. And it was, it was a very hard moment. And it came to the place where we had to decide uh, whether to take him off life support. But I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. My, so my dad was in this place. We were going in talking. Everybody prayed for him. My aunt, I'll say her name too, Sharon Taylor, was a wonderful, wonderful woman of God fiery woman of God, not the kind of person to be messed with. Hi, Cassandra. Good to see you. And uh, my aunt, T uh, Sharon Taylor, was a minister of the gospel. And so she went into my uh, father's room where he was medically induced coma and could not respond to her. And he, she just began to talk to him about his soul. Thank God for people that aren't afraid to talk to someone about their eternal destiny. And so she said, Ed, she said, it doesn't look like you're going to make it out of this. They're telling us you're probably not going to make it. I know you've been resistant to the gospel. And I'm not saying this word for word. So my apologies to uh, uh, the story and, and the storyline. But she said, um, I know you're not going to make it out of here. You need to, to accept Jesus. He wants you to say yes to him. He wants you to receive forgiveness. He wants you to acknowledge that he went to the cross for you. He wants you to say yes to him. And oh, my friend, my heart goes out to this because I think, why do we wait? Why are we so resistant? Normally, we're resistant because of some bad thing that happened to us. And we're, we've been made angry and bitter by it. We kind of bear it because we know we need to go on with life. But that thing just kind of keeps us. You know, I have uh, not always treated people right. I've tried to, but I've made mistakes. So have you. Sometimes people intentionally do things bad. Sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes life does something bad to you that really was out of your control. And in all of these things, there's always the enemy trying to get us to get mad at God. And usually when we do that, that's when we become resistant. So anyway, she prays for him and she's concerned about his soul. And she said, I know you cannot say anything. You cannot utter a prayer right now, but I'm going to lead you in what we call the sinner's prayer said, Ed, I'm going to lead you in the sinner's prayer. And if you want to accept forgiveness in your heart and go to heaven when you pass here shortly, then say this prayer and just mean it with your heart. Be sincere. And he will forgive your sins and he will receive you unto himself. And so she led him in this prayer without him responding, giving him a pause and father in heaven and just waiting, knowing that he's hopefully saying this in his, his mind, you know, because he can hear, right? And they go through the sinner's prayer, and, um, and she's holding on to his hand. And at the very end, she says, Ed, they tell me you cannot respond in any way, 
But if you can, if you can just let me know that you prayed this, would you do something, blink or something? And the one and only time that I'm aware that he responded, the one and only time was right then he squeezed her hand. He squeezed her hand. So in other words, he said, yes, I did say yes to Jesus. Now, that was great. For most of us, that was pretty good. But one of us, whose permission I don't have to say his name, so I won't do that, but one of us was really fearful in, in their heart. One of my siblings, really fearful in their heart that the Lord, uh, that maybe he didn't get right with God. You ever had that? Where you wonder, and the enemy will try to torment with you that. And so uh, this person prayed and said, Lord, you know, I'm concerned that dad really didn't get saved. And there is a heaven and a hell, and nobody wants to talk about that at the passing of people because it's so fearful. One, one side of it is joyful. The other side is, is just, well, it's hellish. It's fearful. Nobody wants to talk about it. And yet he prayed and said, Lord, I need some comfort. So the Lord gave him a dream. And again, my apologies if I butcher this dream, but the essence is this. In the dream, he saw my dad. And my dad was in the hospital bed and he was younger, like in his 30s. This is pretty normal. He's a younger man and he's in bed and Jesus walks in the room. Can you imagine that? Think of the goodness of God, not only to do this, but to give the dream to someone just to let him know. And I've had this happen to someone else recently that, that I know. I won't say their name either. But anyway, Jesus walks in the room. And he, dad sits up in bed, okay? Jesus walks in the room, dad sits up in bed, and he offers my dad, Ed Moore, a cup of water, just a cup in his hand, and he offers him a cup of water. My dad, sitting up in the bed, takes the cup, drinks it, hands it back to Jesus, gets out of bed, and the two of them walk out of the room together. This thing is real. This is not a joke. This is not a fantasy. We are eternal creatures made by an eternal God, and we are designed and destined to live with him forever. However, we have a choice. Even in that dream, he didn't just say, you know, Ed, hey, I know you're a good guy. I know you meant well, even though you rejected me your whole life. Come on, let's go. No, he didn't do that. He still had to say yes, and he offered him I mean, think about that. He, lit, he It was an imagery, right? But he offered him the cup of salvation. That's a biblical uh, term. That's a biblical um, metaphor. He offered him the cup of salvation. And I just want to say, if you're listening today and you have yet to say yes to the Lord, it's really amazing because most people do believe in God and they do believe in an eternity. And they I mean, the, the numbers are like, there's like some 80, 90, 90 some, whatever percent. Most people, why? Because the Bible says he's placed eternity in our hearts. So it's just something, even some tribe off in the middle of the jungles of the Amazon who've never heard about God, or they, they are attuned. They know there's, there's an invisible thing going on, and they believe that there's a creator. And listen, don't, don't silence that. Don't let the voice of the... The educated atheist tell you what you know in your heart to be true, okay? And don't let your bitterness and your disappointment at what you think God should have done in your most distressing situation, don't you let that root of bitterness come into you. I guarantee you one day you'll stand before God and you'll have to talk about whatever that was that troubled you. You're welcome, <laughs> Mom. Yeah, that, that dream has done so much for me over the years. I'm telling you, it just has kept me strong. Because, you know, we're always fighting bitterness. We're always fighting fear. These are the things that every human being, you're not alone. You're not, you're not some unique individual that nobody understands, okay? The Lord says, these, this is what everybody, you know, to one degree or another deals with. Don't let anger, get, don't let bitterness, stop blaming God for everything. One day you'll stand before him and I promise you, you know, if I would put a, you know, if somebody put a gun to my head and said, you know, there's a, you know, yes or no, true or false, and, and we have a way of telling the truth, and if you're wrong, Jim, you, you die. I would literally put my head up to that gun and say, I would hit the true button and say, I believe these things to be true. I know that one day you will stand before God, and that thing that has created hardship and bitterness and anger in your heart towards the Lord, 
he would say, let me tell you what really happened. And let me tell you why it happened the way it did. And you will, at that point, be at peace. You will, at that point, say, oh, my gosh, I wish I'd have understood that before. You know, the, the truth is we're not always going to understand everything now. You have to make your peace with that. God is good. God is greater than you can imagine. He loves you more than you know. He allows things and orchestrates things. He doesn't always do them, okay? But he is, you know, there's stuff that happens in the world and everything. One day, it's all going to make sense. And if you demand that it all makes sense on this side, you're going you're gonna to be troubled your whole life because there will be so many things that you are not going to be able Now, some things God will, like the dream that he gave my uh, sibling about my dad. He was good to do that. But, you know, I mean, basically, he, he honored that person's desire to know the truth about the eternal salvation of my dad. And he gave that. But there are millions of people that have never had that. And I don't know why. Why do some people see Jesus with their eyes open? I mean, like literally, like sitting sitting in a room and suddenly the Lord appears. I don't know. Why do some people get healed of cancer? I don't know. You have got to come to the place where you settle the I don't know. Or else live in bondage, live in fear, live in sorrow, live in bitterness. That bitterness grows in the heart. And you cannot let that bitterness take control of you, okay? We sorrow as others who have no hope. Or excuse me, we, I, I absolutely botched that one. Let me say it again. We do not sorrow as others which have no hope. We know that those who believe in Christ, who pass on, they are standing before the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present, just like you've heard and again, I just, if you, hi, Dale, hi, Linda, if you're just coming on, please go back and listen to the testimony I just gave about my dad. We must accept that there is an unseen realm. How many stories have you heard, and you've probably all heard numbers of them, about a person who passed away? I had this experience. I, I uh, died on the operating table. I came back. They, they brought me back. How many stories have you heard about someone who has done this and they said, I saw myself stand, or lying there on the hospital bed and the doctors feverishly working on me or else my loved ones crying over me. It's called an afterlife experience. And then they came back. What is this? Let's not miss the reality of that. They were still alive. Okay. Their spirit man was standing there. I tell people all the time, if I'm preaching the gospel and drop over dead, and you all rush up. I hope you all rush up and try to give me CPR and all that. But I'm going to be standing off to the side going, oh my gosh, that's me on the floor. We must understand the reality of this. That is the hope. That is the courage. All right, I'm going to read um, a scripture here and then I'm going, to, I'm going to let it go. So the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is an enemy, but it's not the end. We do not understand death the way God does. In God's economy... Death is not a finality. It is a passing through. Okay? Death is not a finality. It is a passing through. We see death as an end. It's finished. It's over. It's done. It'll never go back to the way it was. God does not see it like that. Death is merely a separation. This is how God sees it. It is an enemy. Okay? Let's read it. If I don't read it, I'm not going to get to it. But now Christ is risen from the dead. It was not the end. Okay? It was an enemy. It was an enemy that he conquered, but it was not the end. And it will not be the end for you, and it will not be the end for your loved one. Let's read it. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So basically, that's saying in real simple terms, Everyone who's died in Christ will have the same experience Jesus did. They will raise up from the dead. They are currently alive, okay? They, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They literally are with the Lord right now. That's not a fantasy, okay? That's not a fantasy. It's not a metaphor. It's, the, it's reality. And then one day the scripture says that the Lord will come with 10,000 of his saints, and it says the dead in Christ shall rise. This simply means there is a reconnecting of the Spirit that never did die, right? 
but it's now reconnected with the body, animates the body again. We rise up together with the Lord uh, to meet him in the air, and we are changed, it says in the moment of twinkling. In other words, this corruption, this corruptible body, it can't go into heaven. Corruption cannot inherit in corruption. That means heaven. So what does he do? He, trans he translates our bodies. He, he uh, gives us a new body, and it says that. And these are all things that are in the Bible that I think we've forgotten they're in there, but it's all true. What does the one scripture in James say? It says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. We, we use that scripture to talk about faith without works, but let's not forget what he's saying, the obvious statement he's making about the natural. As the body, that's this, my flesh suit, without the spirit is dead. What happens when the spirit leaves the body? The body falls over. And we look at the body, we go, oh, it's them, it's them, it's them, they're gone. And we, please understand, we, we shouldn't be unemotional about it. That's not what I mean at all. But we have to remember that person is still alive in another realm. They're just not alive in this realm. So death to God is not an end, it's a separation. Okay? God does not see it the same way we see it. Okay? All right. So everyone's going to have that same experience in Christ. For since met by man came death, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. Uh, I'm just going to have to go on. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, the last Adam, shall all be made alive. Again, it's not a fantasy. Each one in his own order, first Christ and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Here again, I just said it. So Jesus Christ was the first one to raise from the dead, okay? And well, now what happened to Jesus when he died? Was that it? Was that done? Was it over? No, no. His spirit, he was he, just like you and me, okay? If he could, he, Jesus had an afterlife experience. Have you ever thought about that? Okay, did he, like, was he dead, dead in his spirit? And he, no, 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 the Bible says his spirit was just as alive as it was a minute ago, went into the bowels of the earth, you know, conquered death, hell, and the grave. I don't want to go into that, but, but then he, he connected with his body. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. He came back into his body. When you pass, or your loved one passes, your spirit is going to one day reconnect with your body. I don't care if they were lost at sea, and they were, they were given up to the elements of the sea and basically disintegrated. I don't care if they were lost in a fire. It doesn't matter. The God who made the body will put that body back together and their spirit will join with their body and they will raise. And he will says, we will not all sleep, or that means die, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. This corruption will put on incorruption. The body that cannot go into heaven because it's a corruptible body will be changed. We shall all be changed. This is truth. Okay, you must see this. And this doesn't mean we don't grieve. We do grieve. But remember, death is an enemy. Jesus, and I'm going to read it here. Okay, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, uh, the Father, and he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. For he, that is Jesus, must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. That's talking about right now. Jesus is reigning through you and I. His kingdom is advanced for you and I. It's going to continue to be that way until every enemy is put under his feet. And here's what it says about death being an enemy. Okay, I finally got to it. 50 minutes into the program. The last enemy that will be destroyed, will be destroyed, is death. There will come a day when there will never be the death of another human being. Death is an enemy, but it's not the end. God has planned separation for every human being until the day that he destroys death. Death is a, a separation of the body from the spirit. Again, this is not metaphor, it's not fantasy, this is true. You've heard enough testimonies to know this, and even if you didn't have a single testimony, it says it in the Bible, and I hope your faith is in his words. But one day, death will be destroyed. No one will ever be subject to it again. Why? Because it will be unnecessary. You say, is it necessary now? Well, apparently it is because the good God of heaven determined that you and I needed an ending date 
so that we could look towards that date and make sure our hearts are right with him every day. This is the issue, the issue of all issues. I was in a church yesterday and I told him, I said, turn to your neighbor and tell him these words. The most important thing, the most important thing is to stay close to Jesus. And then I had him turn to the other neighbor. The most important thing is to stay close to Jesus. If you stay close to Jesus, please hear me. In this life, you will be close to him in the next. And there is an alternative. I don't even want to talk about it right now because we want to talk about life. So it says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then he has put, he will at that point, say, he has put all things under his feet. And then it says he'll hand the kingdom back to the father. All right, God bless you. I hope this has helped you in some small way. Um, just trust that uh, the days that you're living in, as no, no matter how challenging they are, that you hold fast to the Lord. Hold fast to the Lord. He is available. He wants to be near you more than you want to be near to Him. Don't use this passing of your loved one as an opportunity to get angry at God. Do not just start going down that path. Why God? Why God? Why God? Because if you have to ask why uh, the Lord at this time, then you really have to ask why death at all? Why Why do you ever let anybody die? Well, you know, one of the reasons that death is is so hard for us, it's because we're eternal. It doesn't feel right. It never feels right because it isn't. Because death is an enemy, right? You and I are eternal creatures. We have an eternal spirit. Like I said before, if I fall over while I'm preaching the gospel, I'm still going to be standing there. Just like Jesus, when he gave up the ghost, he gave up the, okay, what's that saying? That saying his spirit left his body. Death is not the end. It's, a separ it's just a simply a separation, okay? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. It's separation. When Jesus left his human body on the cross, was he dead? Was he gone? No, he went into his next assignment. So those of you who have lost loved ones, um, yeah, if you're just turning in, I encourage you to go back and listen to all of this, uh, the testimony that I gave about my father and how the Lord saved him while he was in a coma uh, will encourage your heart. And uh, just know that we're for you and we love you. Um, pray for my family. Like I said, we lost a couple of people this weekend and I'm praying for yours and know that this is not the end. Amen. You will see your loved ones if they pass in the Lord, if they pass in Christ, those who die in Christ, we're going to get to see them again. We're going to get, stand before them. Amen. And God wants these issues that happen in life not to be uh, the last thing, the thing that kills your faith, okay? The thing that causes you to go astray. These scenarios can either drive us deeper to the Lord or further away. And for most people, it's going to do one or the other. So you break your agreement with despair and anger and bitterness, and you say, I'm going to use this horrible situation to drive deeper, to dig deeper into the Lord, and to say, I trust you, and I know one day it'll all make sense. It doesn't necessarily have to right now. Go through the grieving process. Find people. Don't isolate yourself. Okay? You may need times to be alone. We understand that. But don't just go find a cave somewhere for the next week or three or, you know, and, well, I'm just going to go and I'm going to grab the bottle and I'm going to grab, you know, a six pack or ten and, and I'm just going to go, you know, uh, drown my sorrow. No, don't do that. That's not that's not the way to life. During You want your emotional health and your spiritual health intact. You need your family. Your family needs you. You need your friends. You don't need to hide this is not one of the times to isolate and to hide. Although, again, you may need times alone with the Lord. That's a good thing as long as it's being alone with the Lord and not with the bottle or some other false comfort. So we're praying for you. We love you. And uh, know that God's going to get you through this. All right, let me pray. Jesus, I thank you for your people. I thank you for all those who have lost loved ones recently or may in the near future. I pray, God, the God of all comfort to give us comfort. We will not grieve as others that have no hope. Lord, we break our agreement with sor the sorrow that brings death. We break our agreement with anger and bitterness. And Lord, we embrace your love and your comfort through these days, we pray. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.
Amen. All right, guys. God bless you. I hope uh, this helped in some way. Again, you don't have to agree with everything I say, but I hope that you see that God has got a plan even in this most difficult of all situations. So God bless you guys. We love you. We're praying for you. Pray for us as well. And as always, give yourself permission to have a great day. God bless you.